Uh, good afternoon for those of you who are on the East Coast of the United States. Good evening for those of you who are joining us from Europe or from Russia. And uh, good morning to anyone who's on the West Coast of the United States. Today, we want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at New York University. And I'm joined by my uh, compatriot here, Alexander Cooley, who is the director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia. This is part of our New York City Russia Public Policy uh, Seminar Series, uh, which we've been host, ho hosting for a number of years now with the generous financial support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. What we try and do in these seminar series is bring together academics and journalists or policymakers together to discuss sort of pressing issues of the day that are facing uh, Russia and this kind of near abroad around Russia. And today, uh, today's session couldn't be more timely. We're going to be talking about state-sponsored hijacking and international responses, the political challenge of the Ryanair incident. I'm going to pass it over now to uh, Alex, uh, who's going to introduce our speakers, but just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Jordan Center and the Harriman Institute for joining us today. And just to give you a very uh, brief set uh, idea of the setup here, the way this is going to work is I'll pass it to Alex in a second, who will introduce our speakers. Alex will introduce each of the speakers in turn right before the speaker uh, speaks. The speakers will then speak for approximately 10 minutes each. We've asked them to prepare some opening statements. And after they're done, we'll open up for a general discussion uh, of your questions. And because we're using the webinar format here, this means we won't actually be having an open discussion, but you should leave questions for the speakers in the Q&A and Alex and I will field those questions and we will pass them along to the speakers. Uh, you should feel free, therefore, to actually use the Q&A throughout the time that the speakers are talking so you can be asking questions as they pop into your head during the speaker's presentations. So uh, we look forward to a robust and elucidating discussion on what is obviously a um, pressing and concerning incident. I'm going to pass it over to Alex right now. So thanks all for being here. Thanks, Josh. And thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. So uh, the session is meant to cover three related issues. The first is to update us with the latest on the repercussions of what the state-sponsored hijacking, the Ryanair flight, which led to the detention of Roman Protasevich um, in Minsk. What's the latest on that? Um, how has this affected uh, internal, domestic, and international politics of Belarus? Uh, the second dimension is uh, how is uh, Russia involved or dealing with this or framing uh, the incident? What's the Russian angle? And the third is, uh, what is this larger universe of uh, uh, actions that we refer to as transnational repression that this is part of? Um, why is this happening um, with seemingly greater frequency now? Um, and what can be done, if anything, um, to combat it? So three really weighty, important issues that are all tied together by this incident. And luckily for us, we have four superb panelists whose expertise stretch across all of those dimensions. Um, and so um, each will be speaking for about 10 minutes. So our first speaker, Hanna Lubakova, who's a freelance journalist and researcher from Belarus and a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, and her CV includes some distinguished awards um, and experiences um, as well as uh, her MA. So I would just say, uh, Hannah, thank you so much for your coverage and your insightful commentary on what has been happening in Belarus. And uh, I understand there are um, uh, developments uh, this morning that some of us may be aware of, but um, um, please welcome and, 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 you know, what is the latest on what this incident has meant for politics in Belarus and uh, Belarus's place within Europe and the world more broadly. Hi, hello, sure. Um, yeah, well, basically just uh, about an hour ago, two hours ago, there was this press conference of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, including some generals who were invited to this press briefing and also including Roman Protasevich, the blogger who, who, was, um, who was arrested in the Ryanair incident. Um, and they brought him here uh, there to kind of uh, say that, you know, he's been treated well. Um, he showed his hands, you know, showing no signs there. He basically said that he's there, uh, came uh, because he, he was willing to do so. And the whole briefing looked um, outrageous, obviously, because, well, Roman was there. And let's remember that he's a hostage. He is a prisoner. 
and they just brought him there from prison, you know, to say how cool is that and how great he, he feels. But also all the things that they were saying, uh, they were blaming the West for uh, for the Western reaction. They were kind of saying that this is not true, whatever the West was saying, and the West is not interested in, um, in the, the kind of investigating what actually happened. So um, yeah, I kind of wrote on Twitter that I feel like um, it's 1984. And I think that's something that many Belarusians also, um, also kind of have in mind. And uh, when I was thinking about what happened and kind of how it all started, I remember my friend wrote kind of laughingly about, about this um, when the plane got diverted that, oh, I hope there was not kind of any incident, a dissident on the plane. And by that moment, I already knew that Roman was there. Um, my friends and I decided not to publish information that he was on board, just to kind of not to draw attention to the fact that he was in the plane because you know they might have missed him or whatever. They might have been just a coincident, coincidence. Um, unfortunately, it was not. So as we all know, uh, the Belarusian regime uh, blamed Hamas for um, planting this bomb with, which turned out a fake, false uh, alert, and uh, even Hamas had to deny kind of uh, and, and um, criticize the, the Belarusian regime for involving them into this issue. Um, so, so what kind of what's happening now um, internationally, I think, uh, well, since kind of it became immediate, immediately clear that Lukashenko diverted the plane because he wanted to catch his basically a personal enemy. He was no longer a threat to his own citizens inside the country, but he became a threat to the region and to the continent because on the plane uh, there were um, foreign citizens, foreign passengers, mostly from the EU. So this is not an internal, internal Belarusian issue anymore. And the reaction followed. We know that um, uh, European airlines have already been banned by their governments from flying over Belarus and flights from Belarus are prohibited from landing in European countries. And these would have more um, like tougher consequences than it seems, because when the av aviation map is changing, then it, it's going to cause some um, kind of increase of uh, in prices uh, and the time of flights. Uh, so this, these uh, there kind of here, uh, there would be consequences. Um, but this is not an aviation issue alone. Uh, we already known about this um, economic sanctions, sectoral sanctions that are expected in the next few days, a few weeks, um, that, that would be imposed not only on businesses close to the Belarusian regime, but also on, on, ex on the export of, of some Belarusian goods. And this is something that is going to affect the regime immensely. There are conversations about sanctions on petrochemical industries, on potash, on metal, on, on, on wood industries. And those interest, industries, those sectors are very much controlled by the regime. So um, kind of this is not affecting kind of people, but this is or at least not kind of to the extent we, we may think because well, there are already repressions of this enterprises in this kind of um, companies that are involved in the sector, but this is definitely is going to cut um, the regime from finances. Now, yesterday G7 leaders stated that uh, they would collaborate together to make the sanctions more effective and to make sure that those responsible for the incidents are punished. Um, and they also called for new elections. Um, propaganda inside the country is blaming the democratic forces for sanctions, um, even though it's basically their fault. Uh, Lukashenko and the government, um, in a way, I think did not expect this reaction from the West. I think they live in this survival mode. Uh, they only think about eliminating their opponents they could not and they do not analyze consequences i think that the kind of disability disappeared in a way um what happened and kind of what led to to this uh, incident is um kind of let's remember that weeks months ago 
um, the head of Belarus KGB, Ivan Terzel, promised to eliminate uh, all traitors to the motherland. Um, Mikhail Karpenko, uh, deputy head of interior minister, ministry, uh, said that um, kind of those uh, dissidents would be treated as terrorists. They would be fined. They were found. They would be again eliminated. And state television is talking about um, you know Stalin-style killing. So the kind of atmosphere in Belarus is basically all about fear and repressions. Um, Lukashenko knows that he kind of has to um, increase the level of repressions because if he stops, people might feel encouraged, people might feel motivated to go to, to, to the streets again. So basically he does not kind of have any choice. Um, as we know, since August, there have been more than 35,000 people arrested, thousands in prison. There are currently uh, more than 470 political prisoners. Um, only uh, uh, kind of few days after the incident, uh, Ryanair incident took place, and our, another political prisoner, Vitol Tashurak, died in the penal colony. Um, kind of there is a crackdown on media outlets. Most recently, the, the kind of the biggest one, Tutbai, was practically demolished, and the regime has no choice but to blame everyone else for the people's dissatisfaction. It's Poland, it's Lithuania, it's the blogger Roman Protasevich. Um, but also what I think is important to mention is uh, kind of the, the atmosphere inside the system is not monolithic. There are defections even from security forces. I think the kind of greatest examples of, of those defections is the investigative committee or the general prosecutor's office. Uh, many people resigned from there. Lukashenko even had to change the um, uh, leadership of uh, the general prosecutor's office because like he saw um, how those people are um, kind of not loyal. Um, but because everyone is scared now and arrested for kind of any opinion, like alternative opinion, people, people just do not um, openly say, right, openly kind of resign. Uh, there is uh, this brain drain, many professionals flee, uh, especially medical workers and IT specialists, and it's going to affect the country immensely. Um, media is completely destroyed. Independent newspapers cannot print. Dozens of websites are closed. Um, but what I kind of, I, at the same time, I think the regime obviously has to survive, but it's very expensive to maintain the status quo. Uh, now Lukashenko, as we saw a few days after the incident, Lukashenko traveled to Sochi to meet with Putin. He uh, asked for money again, and kind of what Putin uh, did, what Putin promised was this $500 million. That's the kind of another tranche of that credit that was promised last year. So this is not something new. Um, at one hand, Minsk is not afraid to kind of do all these outrageous things because he has to, he has Russia support. On the other hand, this support is not that strong as we might imagine. Uh, I think Putin is, is doing just um, as little as he can to help Lukashenko to maintain the status quo. But still to me, it's not clear for how long Moscow is going to support Lukashenko because this is again going to, uh, this is kind of becoming too expensive uh, reputationally and financially as well. And also inside the country, uh, many Russians might ask questions like why are you supporting Lukashenko who is, who is a political bankrupt? Um, yeah, so the solution, um, I think now because, uh, you know, there is this um, isolation and, and kind of sanctions and, and all these regimes, um, yeah, kind of sanction regime, then diplomatic isolation, political isolation. Uh, the solution has to be compre comprehensive. Like there has to be a comprehensive approach to the, to the crisis. Uh, it's important to insist on new elections uh, that should be conducted, conducted this year and um, kind of more steps should be taken. Um, if Lukashenko is allowed to kind of go, you know, go away with this, that this is going to encourage other dictators to do the same. You know, thank you so much. Um, so now let's move to our next speaker, uh, Professor Yuval Weber, who is the Brent Chair of Russian Military and Political Strategy at the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare at the Marine Corps University. And he's also a research assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and public service. Um, 
an expert on all aspects of Russian and Eurasian um, security, as well as writings and research on political and economic topics. Also a member of, I think, the very first one of these that we had. Um, so it's wonderful to uh, welcome you back, uh, Yuval. And I would like to draw attention actually to Professor Weber's um, blog post for the monkey cage, um, that he was one of the first commentators when this incident happened. Maybe we can post that in the chat too. Um, Yuval, welcome. Um, we'd love to get your thoughts on the international relations dimensions of what we've been uh, witnessing in Minsk. Okay, uh, Alex, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, I guess nice to be back as it were. Um, so as, just to follow on from uh, Hannah's comments, um, one of the real aspects of how shocking this was in terms of what it means to international relations and to international law is that a lot of international attention on Belarus had more or less moved on in the past year. So in terms of the topics, the contested election between Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and Alexander Lukashenko, that was a year ago. And lots of stuff had happened, not just in the world with the pandemic getting worse, uh, but also Alexei Navalny coming back from his poisoning induced exile. So in terms of the international attention on Belarus, it had largely moved on, but Alexander Lukashenko has now brought it back. And so one of the things that um, was shocking about this is for Lukashenko, the main sort of objective it, it appears that he had is not just to get one person who is against his particular regime, um, but to make sure that his importance as a wedge issue uh, between the West and Russia did not get ignored and that his control over the country would not be traded away by either side. Um, and so now it is very critical, um, and I'll explain a bit more in a second, that his continued success and uh, presence as the leader of Belarus is now a Russian state objective that had been weakening over the past year. So what exactly happened and what was in effect allegedly illegal about what happened? So as everyone knows, the plane was going from Greece to, um, to Lithuania, it crossed over Belarusian airspace. And one of the little tidbits that I found out during this time um, is that uh, the ballet dancer, uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov, you know, during the Cold War days of the USSR, uh, would never get on a flight that ever went over Soviet airspace because he was afraid any plane over Soviet airspace could get forced down and that he, as a defector, would be obliged to uh, basically have the experience that Mr. Potasevich is having right now. But generally speaking, when the plane went up, the Belarusian authorities said uh, there was a terrorist threat against it, there's a bomb, and that the plane has to come down for everybody's safety. This, of course, put the, the lives of everyone on the plane, as well as the plane itself, at risk. This violated the 1971 Montreal Civil Aviation Convention and the related 1988 airport protocol, which explicitly prohibits violence against people on planes, um, both people on the plane as well as two people on planes, as well as knowingly using false information to endanger an aircraft or its crew and passengers. That's the core thing that Belarus is a signatory of and which they have apparently violated. And so what has happened in terms of the immediate international reaction is that the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is the international organization that governs air travel, is investigating right now. The Biden administration inside the United States, as well as the European Union, uh, decided to go through a multilateral institution ostensibly to give it more um, legitimacy than just sanctioning Belarus directly. But all that said, th th that investigation is ongoing and where it is right now is, as Hannah mentioned, uh, President Lukashenko then went to Sochi and he received a photo op from President Putin, of course, taking along his teenage son as per usual. Um, and both Putin and Lukashenko were together at the front of a boat, which uh, sort of brought, you know, meme recognition that this resembled uh, the movie Titanic. Um, but the main thing that Lukashenko received was a $500 million loan disbursement from Russia. And this is the money that's going to be used to bolster uh, regime stability and resilience at home. Because in addition to whatever sanctions are incoming, which I'll describe more in a second, uh, because as Hannah mentioned, there are no more flights uh, basically from the rest of the world going through or across Belarus. Belarus has also lost it's um, the fees that it charges for overflight, which is about $50 million a month. 
which for a country the relative size of Belarus is a significant amount to lose. So the sanctions that are in process right now at the European Parliament um, and in the US Congress, and Svetlana Tikhonovska has recently testified a number of times before various committees um, here in Washington, DC. And of course, were likely discussed at the G7 uh, meeting a couple of days ago, uh, EU and NATO uh, fora, which are ongoing right now, and will likely be discussed between Presidents Biden and Putin in Geneva later this week, uh, could be devastating because they represent, in effect, a new test case for how to sanction, in effect, entire sectors of an economy um, without trying to disrupt international markets. Now, uh, Belarus is one of the, is a big producer of petrochemicals, but also in particular potash. Nobody knows what potash is, but it's the, it's the magic ingredient in fertilizer. And fertilizer is obviously used across the world. So at this point, what clearly all the, the rumors here about town is, what the Treasury Department is trying to figure out is how to, in effect, sanction the entire potash, alkaline, alkash industries of Belarus without excessively disrupting international markets. It was about two years ago that uh, Oleg Deripaska's aluminum company, Rusal, was sanctioned in a way that truly did disrupt international markets. And so from what I understand, the Treasury Department has been studying for the last two years how to do something like this without disrupting international markets. And it looks like President Lukashenko is going to be the recipient of those two years of research on how to do this. Um, and in addition to that, the, uh, the, the likely sanctions that will be um, imposed um, include the specific sanctions on the, the wealthy people, the oligarchs around Lukashenko. And of course, this is all the background of how to sanction not just big industries or sectors, but also big businessmen right beside the authoritarian leader. Belarus, for the West in terms of sanctions, is going to be a really small Russia in terms of what will be done now will be studied for its effect on how to impose that on the um, on Russia later if it comes to that. Um, so, where is sort of you know the the rest of the EU and and Europe and Russia on this is that the European Union has also pledged to un to give a three million a three billion euro loan and grant to a quote unquote future democratic Belarus. So when Lukashenko leaves power this is the money that will be um, you know, given to the country. And this is a way to try to create a wedge within the Belarusian elite to make them think, what do we want and appreciate more? Lukashenko or 3 billion euros? We'll see, we'll see how well that goes. Um, and finally, in terms of what's happening from the European perspective, Ireland, which was the where Ryanair is from, and Poland, um, you know, where the the flight was uh, registered from, um, are in preparation to seek a criminal case against Belarus. So when we now get to what is Russia's perspective on all of this, um, Roman Protasevich is a Belarusian person, a Belarusian citizen, but his girlfriend who was with him and who's also been arrested. And in the press conference in which Protasevich was basically at a press conference for his own kidnapping through air piracy, just to sort of like, figure out how surreal that is. His girlfriend is a Russian citizen. And obviously Russia in a normal sense would be trying to get its citizens back from you know, unjust uh, detention. The press uh, secretary of President Putin, Dmitry Peskov said, at most Russia is not indifferent to the fate of a Russian citizen who's being held by Belarus. And where Russia is right now is it's being forced to back a client even though it cuts against its preferred public relations position of being a responsible actor on the international stage. Putin for the past 20 odd years has made one big pitch to the West, taking Russia seriously as a great power, taking me seriously as, you know, not your material equal, but your status equal. Suddenly he's being forced to explain why um, a plane is being diverted and a person taken off a plane forcibly. So that goes against um, a lot of the stuff that he's been working on for basically his two, two decades um, in charge. And so this is going to be, you know, something that will divert what Putin originally wanted his summit with uh, President Biden to be. Putin wanted to talk to Biden about the big picture issues, talking about nuclear armed stability, talking about 
What are norms in cyber uh, affairs? What is the, the unacceptability, quote unquote, of Georgia and Ukraine joining NATO? Where is Russia in terms of its actions in Syria, North Africa, and other places around the world? All of those are things in which Russia is either a decisive actor or has, quote unquote, veto capabilities there. What he now has to talk about is he has to now defend and explain his client state, which then, which only sort of clarifies that Russia doesn't have too many client states around the world. It has interests and it has equities, but the only country it can really control in any meaningful way is Belarus, which now everyone is really upset at. And so that's in essence for Russia, a policy loser as an issue. And, you know, there's a lot, you know, we could talk about transnational repression, and I think Nate will be discussing that in greater detail, but I'd love to circle back to that in the Q&A uh, when possible. So let me uh, hand it back over to Alex. You all, thanks. You've already covered a tremendous amount of territory there. So, um, yep, our next speaker, Nate Schenken, who is uh, also no stranger to the Harriman Institute or Columbia, so we're welcoming him back. Um, he is a director of research strategy at Freedom House. He previously served as director for special research at Freedom House. And he is one of the authors of um, a report um, that came out this year on transnational repression as a global phenomenon. Um, and so Nate himself has deep expertise in Russia, Eurasia, Turkey, but this was um, looking at uh, the phenomenon from a more global perspective. And also, perhaps we can also post a link in the chat, the author of a Foreign Affairs Online article on um, why this is sort of the next stage and the similarities and differences between this and other forms of transnational repression. Nate, uh, welcome back, although it's always under these kind of adverse circumstances that you seem to come back. But we're really interested in, in your take about what's going on here. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. And um, it's really great to be here with this group, um, very impressive. I, I'm going to speak a little bit more broadly and more from the perspective of transnational repression. I'll, I'll leave some of the more nuanced grasp at this point of the Belarus dynamics, but also Belarus-Russia dynamics to others. But let me reflect on the transnational repression element. Um, to be clear, we talk about transnational repression at Freedom House as a, as a pretty broad category. So covering acts all the way from assassinations to kidnappings, to manipulating host institutions for detentions and deportations, um, to digital intimidation and to um, coercion by proxy or family intimidation. Um, it's quite a broad category. We would definitely consider that what's happened now to Protasevich and Sapega to fall within it. Um, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit about what's, what's typical here and what's atypical. Um, the typical part, the most typical part, um, is this blurring between inside and outside, uh, which I think we've all been sort of weaving through as we talk, is the way in which um, this isn't really a Belarus problem anymore, if it ever was. Um, and you can see that in the tactic that's been used. You can see it now in the responses that are being developed. Um, and I'll speak about that a little more at the end. Um, but you also see it in how it emerged and, and who Roman Protasevich is and what he does, right? Um, here we have um, someone who's lived outside of Belarus for a few years, um, who was forced to leave the country um, for political reasons, a political exile, um, yet who through his work, as a journalist, as someone deeply involved in, in journalism and in opposition activities, is very enmeshed with inside of Belarus, quote unquote, inside. Um, and enmeshed not just uh, on a casual basis or on a regular basis, but literally moment by moment and day to day. Um, obviously, the techno technological aspect of that is very key um, through Telegram, through other kinds of communications technologies, both for dissemination and for um, communication of information, you have um, this deep interweaving um, between inside and outside. I won't say that the lines have disappeared, that the borders no longer matter or exist. They do, of course, um, both formally and legally, um, but they also uh, have become more blurred and, and more in contact. And, and so his voice and the voice of other Belarusians who are forced to be outside of Belarus now um, are also, uh, those voices are stronger within Belarus than they would be otherwise due to this 
changing environment in which they, they operate. Um, that's been a process that's been going on for a long time around the world. It's been going on for a long time with Belarusians who have, you know, there's been opposition and exile evolving over decades, um, essentially throughout the independent period. Um, but I would say it's reached a higher point now, uh, especially in the last several years. Um, on the other side of that, though, and again, this is very typical, this is very much what we're talking about in transnational oppression, the technology has increased the reach of the states themselves that are pursuing people. So it, it, it increases their capacity su to sustain um, sur surveillance. Um, and we don't know the exact tools here that the Belarusian regime was using, but it's this can be open source surveillance. So monitoring people's social media feeds, um, the ways in which they present information about themselves to the public. Um, it can be um, more private, more kind of custom made or more like technologically sophisticated forms of interception um, or hacking. Um, it, all of those can work separately. They can work in combination. Essentially, the state has more capacity as well. Um, and this is true for a state like Belarus, which is obviously has a very powerful and, and quite um, well resourced security state, you know, very strong um, Soviet style um, security apparatus. It's also true of less well resourced states. And we saw this in our global report and we talked about this. You have states, even like Tajikistan, um, that you don't think of as being, you know, kind of states capable of doing like a lot of activity abroad. And yet, if they focus on this and choose to dedicate a certain amount of resources, they can actually accomplish quite a lot. Um, that's the typical part. Um, the atypical part um, is, of course, using a fighter jet to bring down a commercial airliner. This is not a thing that happens very often. Um, that's sort of the, the baseline atypicality. Um, the, the, the second part I would emphasize is that it's actually atypical when states act unilaterally. Um, and I think Yuval's analysis was very interesting impression about what might be behind Lukashenko's motivations for taking such an extreme step, um, essentially without permission or without um, cooperation, especially from a host state. Um, it's really quite rare that states do these things without having some kind of host state institution that they have co-opted. Um, most of the time what's happening is that someone is finding a way to suborn a law enforcement or security service institution or a migration institution um, inside of a host state and using that to get to the person. And of course that makes sense from a resource perspective. Um, it makes sense as well from a legal perspective. It's easier to claim plausible deniability. Um, you don't wind up in this very extremely um, implausible situation that Belarus is in now. Um, now I'll say just a few things about advocacy, because Alex, I think you asked about that um, regarding sort of advocacy on transnational repression and on this problem. It, it is something that we've seen this year over the last, I guess now six months, um, and especially under a new administration in the US, uh, but also in Europe, quite a lot of interest in talking through and thinking about how to address this problem. Um, and I do think that that conversation is moving relatively well, um, considering it's we're, we're behind, frankly, you know, we're probably behind on responses, but we're actually much further than, you know, I hoped we would be perhaps at this stage. Um, and the, the, the best part of that interest, and the most important part is I think there's real interest in seeing these things as both part of a bigger holistic problem um, something relating to the resilience of institutions within host states, the ways in which exiles or other diaspora members um, gain rights, exercise rights in the places where they live. Um, so that holistic aspect, but also looking at very specific country specific and incident specific responses like we're seeing right now around this. Um, it is important, I wrote about this in Foreign Affairs, it's important when something like this happens to address it concretely and directly, um, including through um, a response that, uh, that doesn't leave this person or people, uh, treats these people as others, doesn't treat them as subjects of Belarus. Essentially, that's what we have to reject. We have to reject the idea that at bottom, uh, the Belarusian state has a claim here that it can simply take people. Um, and, and possess them and do what they like with them. And it'll be okay for us because ultimately these aren't our people. Um, we need to reject that. And I do think that there's actually, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic about the response um, to come and, and the, the willingness to really respond very firmly. Um, then last, I'll just say on the, the, cause I think Alex, you mentioned this as well, maybe for others as also, but like, I think there's more we can do here also in developing this strategy going forward on an advocacy strategy. Um, 
this includes both strengthening exile support networks. There's been a lot of work on that in the NGO space um, over 10, 20 years. There's been a lot of work developing there and I think it's gotten better, but we can continue to invest in it and supporting a specific advocacy agenda addressing transnational repression because there are certain policy specific steps um, that we're seeing policymakers interested in and that we're, we're seeing traction um, being gained around fixing those holes and fixing those gaps. And so I do think there's a window of opportunity. It's never going to be a perfect pr uh, protection. There's always going to be kind of a whack-a-mole um, aspect to this because you're you're up against people who are very determined to do these kinds of things um, but there are things you can do to make it less likely um, and and i hope that we can continue to make progress on that thanks nate thank you um, and our fourth speaker today um, and that was actually a perfect segue in the end someone who has worked extensively in this space is uh, Tatiana Margolin, who's Regional Director for Open Society Eurasia Program, previously a Division Director for the program. And she has led the program's work on responding to the reactionary backlash and closing civic space, not only in Belarus, but across the Eurasia uh, region. Um, she is an attorney by training and has previously worked as a foreign law clerk at the Supreme Court of Israel and staff attorney at the Women's Law Project. And just in the interest of full disclosure, um, I serve on uh, Tanya's regional advisory board too. So Tanya, uh, welcome to the discussion. Um, and we're really interested in your take um, as, as not only a, a keen analytical observer, but someone who's been trying to do something about this and flag this issue um, for many years now. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you um, to the other panelists. I've already learned a lot just listening to all of you um, today. So I will speak um, a little bit to the role of exile media and networks, and explicitly on what has shifted in how philanthropy perceives what should be supported on the ground. Um, and I just want to pause and reflect the fact that it's only been three weeks since the hijacking, which is, you know, it just really blows the mind that sort of, you know, three weeks go by, it now seems almost like a distant past. And um, in terms of what concretely has transpired since then, I think the answer on my part at least would be not enough. Um, I genuinely thought this was gonna be a really big game changer when this occurred. I mean, the shock um, value and element of it for the whole world, I thought truly was gonna change the momentum. And I agree, I think there is some movement on sanctions and I think it has you know, made Europe realize that this is a really dangerous dictator who is sitting within our borders. But again, I would have hoped on May 23rd when I was watching this unfold, I really would have hoped that we would be at a different place on June 14th. Um, than we are now. Um, and also I wanna emphasize how important it is something that Hannah said that other um, authoritarians are watching this and they're watching that this is something that you can just do now. You can hijack a civilian aircraft, you can land it and you can just go on. Um, Patash sanctions should they happen would hurt. But again, I think in terms of the immediate reaction um, and if I were watching it um, you know, as an Erdogan or other authoritarian, I think really, <laughs> not that much has happened or not as much as should have happened. And that is genuinely egregious and outrageous. Um, and I'm glad we're still talking about it, right? Because in a lot of ways, in terms of press coverage, et cetera, this is already kind of old news. People have moved on from this. Um, and of course we saw two weeks after the um, landing of the Ryan airplane, we saw a opposition politician in Russia being pulled off an airplane and the visual was very stark. It was very similar. Obviously the circumstances were different, but when Pivovarov, who was formerly head of Open Russia, um, it was pulled off a St. Petersburg airplane after he had passed through customs. You know, there were many ways and many times opportunities in his air airplane journey to um, prevent him from leaving, but yet they chose to turn around a civilian aircraft to really demonstrate it and pull him off. So it really seems that this shock and awe tactic in the authoritarian toolbox is becoming ever more important right now. We're seeing it used more and more. Um, immediately um, after the um, uh, uprising in August in Belarus, of course, we saw um, the Russia Today team arriving in Belarus, invited by Lukashenko in order to uh, present a spiffy image of the regime and try to salvage them in terms of, you know, in front of the in front of the public. And um, I, I would argue the propagandists did not succeed. I think Belarusian um, people are not watching ONTN television and kind of believing it. 
So I think that's when the pivotal moment happened of going after independent media and independent press coverage. And that's when Nyechta, of course, was taking over and dominating with um, its sort of mind-blowing numbers of subscribers. There were, I think, at some point over 2 million people subscribed to Nyechta. Now it's 1.3, but still, that's a huge number. So we definitely saw uh, the regime begin to wage a serious war against independent journalists. It's not to say that they were living in comfortable environments before them, but that that was, I think, a pivotal moment where independent journalists really became target number one. And of course, the landing of the airplane is the culmination of this. I mean, sort of the most brazen attempt at stopping um, and shutting down voices of independent media. And really, from where I'm sitting, it is the greatest validation of the effect of independent media and the greatest sort of accolade to Belarusian independent journalists to watch this happen. Clearly what you're doing, and of course, Hannah is you know, the closest to the people we have who are in the profession here, um, it's really getting under the skin. It's making a huge difference. And this um, hijacking was just, again, it, it was validation of that. Um, we saw NECTA, of course, document with gruesome and grueling detail the egregious violations that are taking place in Belarus before the protests and after them. And um, you could tell that the regime just, you know, was really bothered and really couldn't take it anymore. And so then we saw this uh, take place. In terms of philanthropy and in terms of exile media, I will say that, and again, Alex had disclosed that he's, he's on my board. You know, it's been an uphill battle to get philanthropy and... Um, and to get donors to care about exile media. There has been this consistent, again, Nate thankfully touched on it. So you gave me this opening to just, you know, you gave the introduction and I can just expand a little bit. Um, there is this inherent belief that unless you're on the ground, you can't really be authoritatively speaking as to what's going on on the ground. Um, and once you're in exile, once you leave the country, there's no more, you know, you're not connected. You can't possibly know what's going on. And again, of course, I think even to this day, and even me as a donor, you know, if I'm able to support someone on the ground, I do think that they would likely, you know, take precedent over people who are um, away. I think typically we would still choose where possible to support voices, independent voices on the ground. But we're seeing that be more and more of an impossibility in the Eurasia region for sure, and really globally. Um, in Belarus, first and foremost, because that's the subject of this conversation. But of course, we're also watching that um, be in Russia. And for many years now, we've seen this be the case in Azerbaijan. Uh, Maidan TV was, for example, one of the first outfits that I've encountered in terms of, you know, who were in terms of operating from abroad, but really being widely viewed on the ground, even though there were all sorts of technological hurdles to be overcome, because the state really fought access to Maidan TV. And again, I think Maidan TV was a bit of an opening for the world to see actually you can be reporting accurately and cred credibly on about what's going on on the ground from outside the country. But I think Medusa really was a turning point in terms of an outfit that, you know, very openly registered abroad uh, and was reporting um, from abroad about what's going on in Russia. Now, Medusa, of course, did then change its business model and really had a lot of journalists based on the ground and um, really portrayed itself not as an exile publication, but as a Russian publication. And its stringers, you know, had a lot of access to sources in Russia, et cetera. And of course, we just saw the Russian state go after Medusa very recently by declaring it undesirable um, foreign agent and challenging its existing financing and advertising schemes. And in Belarus, of course, we saw, as kind of mentioned, touched on, we saw the shutdown of Tutbai, the country's most um, widely read independent voice, the same week that the Protasevich plane was brought down. And really, when I was watching the Tutbai uh, disaster unfold, I really thought that was the red line. You know, the, the I mean, over six, I think um, there were six million unique visitors a week, uh, a day. So the, the readership really was so vast and so many different platforms depended on Tutbai that watching that outfit be shut down, it was pretty incredible. Yet, of course, who is even talking about Tutbai anymore because the airplane hijacking, you know, took over the headlines, whatever headlines Tutbai was even able to gather. Um, and now it's sort of, we're moved on. So I think with the Tutbai um, shutdown, it really is the case that exile media is the media to support in Belarus. And I think there is no longer this case that I need to be making to other philanthropies or within my own saying that yes, exile voices need to be supported because at this point at, in Belarus, oftentimes these are the only voices that can be supported. And additionally, I will also say that there has been um, a lot of debate in the, philanthropy community as to what the role of security trainings and safety and security trainings is for journalists and other people on the ground and in exile, whether or not it's something that philanthropy should be supporting. And again, I think after this 
event. That is, again, something that I think is no longer up for discussion. I think um, security trainings are a must and something that, you know, must be by other donors and philanthropies folded into all support that is given to not just media outlets, but really to anyone working in close society and with autocrats. And I will say just in general, the, you know, there was this interview today that several speakers mentioned that was hard to watch, but the ONT interview that came out, I believe two weeks ago, um, where Protasevich, you know, that was his, sort of the first time they paraded him around and tried to show us that he flipped. I think that was really an intentional try attempt to portray a triumph of state media over independent media. And I think it was um, in that respect, an, a giant fail. Of course it was, you know, nobody was fooled. This was a hostage interview, but I think it was a really important visual for the regime that the regime was really trying to accomplish, right? Because sort of like he was pulled out from his behind the curtains, telegram, anonymous voice. And now he was on this um, Owen Tez sort of blazing on this channel that is, you know, um, showing pure propaganda day in and day out. And it was really, I think, an important visual for the state to show that it like won, it was one zero the state. But I think again, nobody was fooled. So in sum, the, I will say that I think that not enough has happened since the event in terms of advocacy, in terms of outcomes. And I think this definitely showed the weakness in terms of EU institutions and the speed of EU institutions to get things done. Uh, we know that these, this last round of sanctions was delayed multiple times. Um, I think it did, I presume it, it played a key role in speeding up this last round, but nevertheless, um, I think this is really a moment for the EU to reflect and, and, and say, you know, this, this is not okay for us to act so slowly when something so egregious happens, uh, because it really sends pretty strong message to other autocrats and also to other Western states, because really this is the EU territory. This is a EU's moment to step up and act. And I don't, I don't think they've done that enough. So um, I'll end here and hand it over back to the moderators. Thank you so much again. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks all of you for your um, thorough answers to this great introduction. We have about 40 minutes left for discussion now, and I'm, I want to kick off the, the questions myself, but I encourage everybody else to take a time now. If you want to add a question to our growing list in the Q&A uh, below in the webinar chat, you can find that at the bottom lower right hand side of your screen where it says Q&A. And we'll get to the questions there in a moment. I thought I would start with sort of like two, you guys have all provided so much information. This has been so elucidating. Um, I thought I would start with sort of like two big picture questions, one aimed at what's going on in Belarus and one aimed at what's going on outside of Belarus, not Nate to, to deny that the two are linked, but, it, but to even more show, show that the two are linked uh, in this. But I, these are sort of big picture questions that go, I think, you know, to the heart of the matter um, above all of the sort of specific logistical details that you've given us. So, so I'd be interested in answers from all of the panelists on these. The first is, Within Belarus, has the hijacking and all of the international response to it, including both the EU response, the sanctions, the potential things coming down the road, but also the Russian response, as Hannah and Yuval were talking about, and the Sochi visit and the funds, everything that's followed in the last three weeks that's you know reasonably directly linked to the hijacking, has that ultimately strengthened or weakened the Lukashenko regime? Is Lukashenko in a stronger place or is he in a weaker place than he was three weeks ago before the hijacking? That's the first question. And then the second question, pivoting off of this, pushing Belarus aside for a second and thinking about the hijacking, because we, we've heard a lot of comments from speakers, especially Tanya was just mentioning this at the end, but, you got, but Nate, you got, were on this as well, about the lessons that will be drawn and the lessons learned by how the international community responds. So I, on my second sort of big picture question, has the international response that we've seen in three weeks, and, and we'll take the caveat that, yes, it feels like it was a long time ago, but it really wasn't that long time ago. So that we've seen in three weeks and that we anticipate is coming based on what you four as the experts know about what you think is coming on the international scene. Has the international response led us to think that we would be see this type of behavior? And by this type of behavior, I mean, literally states forcing down planes with dissidents on them, which will going forward, from Yuval, I will now call this the Barishnikov nightmare um, as the situation here, right? Is this more or less likely to happen in the future? Has something happened in the last three weeks that if we, three years from now, are we going to be talking about the first of a series of incidents where uh, dissidents were forced down by other states around the world? So not Belarus specific, or has the reaction 
to this incident been of a, such a nature that this is likely to end up being a kind of one shot deal where we look back on this was Lukashenko being a bit nuts and for whatever reason, and not something that became a sort of thing that we got used to of planes being forced down over airspace um, when dissidents are on board them. So I'll open up the, either of those two questions to all four of the panelists now, and maybe, um, well, I'll just go in or any order you guys would like to respond. Yeah, maybe Hannah, do you want to start with the question about strengthening or weakening Lukashenko? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so so last thing about what Lukashenko has gained. So he sent a signal to every dissident abroad that every everybody, everyone can be found, everybody can be detained. Um, he he tried to scare others, and I think that's where he is successful. Uh, that's kind of uh, what caused a lot of the kind of stress and you know frustration among among, among us basically. Um, he's now using Roman as a trophy. Uh, see this press conference that took place earlier today. Then that um, interview in which Roman was basically interrogated on state TV and he was um, told to say um, the kind of things that never took place and and kind of create some um, conspiracy theories, whatever. Um, then he sent a signal to um, Russia that look, I'm with you. Uh, I will never be kind of more, there would never be more anti-Western leader than, than myself. So you should kind of help me, you should cherish me. That's where he was sort of successful. The thing with Roman is that nobody believes him People inside Belarus do not believe in whatever Roman is forced to say. He knows that that he, they know that he is a hostage, and because they never kind of they stopped trusting state television years ago, uh, that's why Lukashenko like kind of here it was not successful. So on the other hand, he definitely showed that he is weak because somebody who is who is confident of his position um, inside the country would not do this, would not to kind of. Uh, hijack planes, right? Uh, it's too much for anyone, basically. And I think those supporters who might have still kind of be on his side or kind of not, not you know, he um, hesitating, uh, finally decided, you know, that, you know, this is just too much. There are obviously people who, who, who still support him and who will support him, you know, and this is not a lot of people. A uh, few months ago, we had this um, independent research that, that showed that more than 70% of, of people of the population want changes, which is which is a lot, right? This is the majority. So Lukashenko clearly lost the support of, of, of the majority. And whatever mistakes he has, whatever kind of chaotic uh, action he takes, it only kind of weakens his position. Um, and yeah, now I think he, he has become like very toxic for 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 the West. Uh, the response is following, you know, more response. We should expect more response. Um, so that's kind of the uh, the what what he gained, right? He I think um, they only kind of lost than than mm -hmm. um, than gained something. You all, you want to weigh in here? So sure. So I mean, I think um, to to Josh's direct question, does it make him stronger or weaker? I would say that what we've seen over the past few weeks has made Lukashenko far stronger in the short term and far weaker and more replaceable in the long term. Because we've seen in a number of, not just from Belarus last year, but Ukraine, lots of other situations in which there has been people power challenging, you know, the, the autocrat or the authoritarian leader in charge. The way that those leaders stay, and basically defeat whatever's happening on the street is if they're willing to use more violence than the people on the street are able to muster in return. And if they have some sort of great power protector. And what we've seen over the past three weeks is the $500 million plus the, the photo op in Sochi, that's the second thing. And clearly Lukashenko is going to do whatever it takes. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people going to uh, jail, literally willing to like hijack a plane, um, however many people like, that the, that regime is going to murder while they're in prison, he's showing that he's going to do whatever it takes. But the consequence of that is over time, the value of having an ally, an ally like that for Russia is going to decrease. And once Putin thinks this guy's more trouble than he's worth, 
then the combined pressure of the rest of the world, Lukashenko will be gone very quickly, uh, as what happened to um, Yanukovych and so forth. And so, and the second question is, what are the, the, the lessons learned? There was actually a question in the Q&A that basically go, gets to this, which was um, from Mr. Uh, Cattell, Andrew Cattell, um, what can the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, what can they actually do here? So the direct penalties uh, that the ICAO, and this is sort of the body of the international community, they can suspend Belarus's rights, like in this body, and also against Russia if Russia is found to have participated. And what that would mean would be suspension of international oversight of aviation and of international aviation in Belarus and of international aviation through Belarusian airports, which would mean that international aviation could not go through or to or from Belarus. That would mean the entire country is basically cut off from the rest of the world in terms of aviation. And that means Russia would have to choose between supporting its ally or giving up its own international aviation. The second thing is um, the international community, and this is as clearly what the United States and Europe want, is if the ICAO finds that it was not in fact Hamas who did this, but it was the Belarusians, that that would be the justification for all the broad range of sanctions that we just described earlier. And that would be the pressure of the international community. And in, in effect, if those things don't happen, as Nate was suggesting, this is gonna happen quite more often because what would be like the real downside cost towards getting, let's say your state's number one international um, dissident opponent, whatever. And so those would be basically the things I would see. Short term, Lukashenko is gonna do whatever it takes. Long term, he's gonna be a, a pain in the neck. And then how basically the ICAO and international community treat the hijacking part will then help shape when and how Lukashenko leaves power. Well, thanks for that very crisp uh, uh, short-term, long-term uh, prognosis there. Uh, Nate, do you want to tackle those? Sure, I mean, I, I can talk be... about the, the Kyrgyz Turkish dimension too. <laughs> camera maybe you can say something right like sure yeah i can be brief i mean and, and and i'll i'll say on the first on the inside or as i perceive the the cost benefit i think uval has made a very cogent case for this pivot towards russian patronage clientelism the, the issue of course is that lukashenko has for decades built his stability and his regime on pivoting back and forth um going a little closer to one side and a little closer to the other but never too far never too far into Russian clientelism, never too far into European um, rapprochement. And the, it's always been this balance. To me, this is too far. There, there's no way, there should be no way, a European community uh, and transatlantic community is gonna allow Lukashenko back in, um, even in the way it was allowing him back in over the last several years. I mean, recall, we were looking at like a detente basically just a couple of years ago, U.S. ambassador finally returning to Belarus, um, real discussion about ways in which, you know, there was this kind of uh, U.S. administration had an idea that they could maybe split Belarus away from Russia through more engagement. You know, it was going in that direction, and this was very much Lukashenko's kind of game. That's closed, and I don't think that's just closed for a year or two years. That's closed for a decade. You know, no one who works in policy on this region is going to forgive this. Um, for as long as they work, <laughs> you know, this is unforgivable. Um, so I, I think he's gone too far. I think in that sense, he's, he's kind of blown up his own game and has made himself far too dependent on Putin um, and on the Russian, whatever the disposition of powers remains in Russia going forward. Um, on the second part, I mean, I'm not gonna predict that we're gonna see a lot of skyjackings. This is ultimately like, this is a very dangerous thing to do. It's very complex. It can go very wrong, far, far more wrong than it went this time in that you can knock the plane out of the sky and kill hundreds of people. Um, you can, there's all sorts of other things that can happen. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna say that that's going to become more prevalent. I do think, and we see this all around, and Alex, you mentioned, we see all sorts of transnational repression, including some of the most violent stuff becoming very common. Um, you know, you mentioned Turkey and the situation in Kyrgyzstan. Turkey is on a, I guess it's been five years now, um, coming up next month, um, Turkey's on a five-year kidnapping spree <laughs> um, all over the country, uh, all over the world, excuse me, uh, that involves rendering over 100 people from all over the world. Um, 
that's mostly been done, again, through co-opting host state institutions, but it's very much renditions. These are very much people being put on intelligence agency planes and brought back to Turkey and paraded in front of the cameras. There's been nothing uh, to that as a consequence. Um, so I do think we're going to be seeing, unless we catch up a little bit more to the sense of impunity, we're going to be seeing this, these practices becoming normalized if we haven't already. Um, maybe not specifically skyjackings themselves, but other forms of very extreme transnational repression. And Tanya, your take on uh, on these questions. I'm not going to repeat what most of the panelists already said, so I'll just be quite brief. I think um, in terms of has it weakened the regime, I think um, it has put the regime in the corner. I mean, this is not something that can be forgotten. This is no longer a regime that can pivot west. They is exactly right. You know, uh, Lukashenko has been considered this sort of like wizard who is able to play east and west against each other and he can land wherever he wants. I mean, you know, I criticize the use response. Let's hope that at least this makes him, you know, not handshakeable. Like this should make Lukashenko and his boy and, you know, someone who can never be seen in any setting with any European leader in any group photo um, he's utterly isolated in a corner. I think, um, you know, inter we didn't touch very much on sort of how Russia perceived it. Um, I was hoping we'd go a little bit more into that. I think, um, I think Putin is dealing with someone who is unhinged and he knows that, you know, there's no love between those two. We all know there's been tons of things written about um, sort of Lukashenko pushing Putin's buttons. And I think in this instance, I'm sure there were even a lot of debates about that Titanic photo op, whether or not it was a good idea. They still went ahead with it, but I'm sure that it was not kind of a uniform, everyone who is for it say yay, and everyone said yay. I'm sure there was debate. Because I think, again, Russia is still trying, you saw the MSNBC interview, you know, he's still trying to be handshakeable. Uh, he's still trying to meet with um, Biden, Putin. So I think, again, Lukashenko is becoming very toxic. Um, I think one of the purposes of this and whether or not we'll see more um, hijackings, I think Nate is right. I think practically it's a difficult thing to do. But I think one of the goals was to stifle uh, opposition voices abroad and to introduce um, self-censorship for journalists working abroad. You know, he sort of acknowledged that all the important media is no longer in Belarus. So now he has to go after the ones that are outside the borders. And will it persuade some people to say, actually, like, even though I'm in Warsaw now, it's still not worth it, you know, and looking behind sort of, you know, be, being afraid to work in a walk in a dark alley or get on a plane, that might happen. I think that might happen. And that would be very normal. And I would never judge the people who would feel this way, because uh, people have the right to make their own choices about safety, and security, and how much risk they want to take for their families. But again, I think in, it has made him more isolated and the regime looks increasingly desperate and the Belarusian people, um, and again, full disclosure, I'm from Belarus. Um, the Belarusian people don't want their state to look like this. This is not a Belarusian thing to, for the regime to, you know, for their government to be hostage taking plane landing regime. Belarusians are peaceful, kind people. And that's the, that's, those are the leaders that they deserve and want. Tanya, thank you. So next question, I'm going to bundle a couple, and this is going to go out to uh, you all. So uh, uh, a question from Andrew uh, Cattell, as well as um, Andre Groshkin um, about uh, what about ism regarding this incident and specifically uh, the reference, I think it was a uh the MFA spokesperson who uh, uh, mentioned uh, the plane of a foreign government official, Evo Morales is being forced to reroute and uh, land in Austria. Uh, some time ago in, in the search of whether because of Snowden was on there. Um, so uh, you've all maybe, could you address the questions about sort of this as a tactic in this particular case? And I, you know, in the broader kind of universe of what about is in politics, I know this is something you're, you're quite interested in, quite good at explaining. So sure. So the, let's, the second question first is what about ism is the idea that if the, the speaker or the person doing something is not totally uh, clear, unguilty of all things ever in the past, therefore um, any of the issues that are being discussed is therefore, you know, you know, six of one half dozen of, of the other. And so we saw this during the MH17, we've seen this in a number of sort of situations in which there's a bad storyline that comes out and the narrative is not favorable to Russia or to its clients. So then something will get brought out in order to just confuse the narrative. Uh, and this is the information confrontation. And what will happen in just the world writ large 
is it's unclear what is the actual truth, what is the falsehood, what is things that are seemingly true, seemingly false, and then it just becomes difficult to comprehend any one part of it, and then it just seems uh, international politics is hard and complicated, let me disengage from this. So that's the general purpose of what about is it. In this particular one, and again, much respect to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs staffer with a long enough memory to uh, remember this, because I totally uh, memory hold that particular thing. So the key thing, and so for those who are not aware, in it was I guess 2012 or 2013, whenever Edward Snowden was in the, was in the news, um, there was a concern that uh, Edward Snowden had gone onto the plane of then Bolivian president Evo Morales. Uh, Evo Morales was in Russia for one of these international events, was going home to Bolivia. The, the concern by many in the, the United States and its allies is that if Snowden is on this plane, that this plane should basically like not have the ability to go through Europe. So the countries such as France, um, Spain, and others denied the airspace permission to the state airplane, and that's a critical part, the state airplane of Bolivia that had Morales. So when the state airplane basically could not fly through this phalanx of uh, prohibited airspace, they decided to land in Austria, and at which point the plane was searched, there was clearly no Snowden on board, and the plane went off. Now, that's obviously the plane going down out of order, that seems to be the thing that is alike here. What is the difference here is that state airplanes sovereignty arguments fall under basically the Geneva Conventions. Those have a totally different set of international laws and norms associated with them. The stuff that we're talking about today is about civil aviation, non-military, non-government. So the apples to apples comparison doesn't fit here. But what about, in essence, the, the big issue here? Can states basically um, be inviolate in their airplanes? And so when it came to the issue of Evo Morales, and he was, of course, very upset by this, all the countries which uh, had forced his, which had prohibited his airplane from using their airspace, they apologized for acting out of order. What we haven't seen from Belarus or ostensibly from Russia is any note that anything here was out of order. And I think going to Nate's particular question or Nate's uh, points from earlier, is that if states can use basically a contrived or made up terrorism excuse, then to basically force down an airplane, then that makes all aviation, not just military or, or governmental aviation, but literally all aviation is, we don't like what's going on with that. We're gonna put this down. And if you don't put it down, because we said there's a bomb on board, who knows what we're going to do in order to force it down. And so that's the escalatory sort of danger here is, using the, this using this as an excuse uh, could lead to a lot, not just like a lack of safety in the skies, but also if you have to figure out which are the countries we have to avoid, literally all aviation is gonna become more expensive as it takes longer and uses more fuel to get from point A to point B. So that's basically the, the what about is um, generally and specifically. Great, thanks so much Yuval. Uh, Josh with the next question. Yeah, exactly. thanks, Alex. I'm going to uh, pull on a question, uh, draw on a question here that was asked by uh, Dmitry uh, Karenka in the Q&A, which is about the sort of strong end of the Western response. So we've talked about here that, you know, that's been mentioned about the, the upcoming, you know, the investigation that's going to come and it's going to make a ruling. If the ruling determines that Hamas had nothing to do with this and that this was a Belarus, this was a, a, an instigation of the Belarusian state, I mean, how far do you all think this is the, the, the West is likely to push it in terms of responses? So the issue that was uh, that um, Yuval, that you were mentioning beforehand about um, completely suspending Belarus's membership so that, you know, you it, cutting off entirely from aviation space. I mean, that wasn't that was, you know, that that seems like a very much of a sort of nuclear option uh, in terms of what's going on here. So do we think we'll get what we'll, you would get to something that far? There's already been a lot of discussion of sanctions and, 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 and using lessons from past sanctions to try to target 
sanctions in very particular ways. And sort of, I think, uh, I forget who said it, maybe Nate, you said it earlier that, that Belarus will be the new little Russia. And so you'll have the sort of Russia playbook where you try not to disrupt the population as much as you target these sanctions. But could we see something even, even stronger from that? And then, and, and one thing that I'll just push on a little bit on this is that, uh, Tanya, I just want to push you a little bit on the idea that like the West is not is no longer going to entertain anything having to do with Lukashenko, right? I mean, he has, you know, the enemy of the enemy right here, and he has shown an, a, an ability over the years uh, to play this game quite cagely. Um, you know, is do you really, do you think there's absolutely no situation under which he won't dangle to the West flipping back on Putin and that, and that this is entirely, this door is completely closed at this point? Um, I understand that it's closed in the short term, absolutely. But in the medium term, if he manages to survive this situation, do we really think there's no situation? Is he, is he actually, just to push a little bit more, because I think it's in the context of the spirit of this question, is he really, really completely dependent on Putin at, for all future at this point? Um, or is there a chance he can sort of repeat the past playbook a little bit? Do you want me to start with that question, Josh? Sure. Um, look, um, maybe it's because I refuse to even entertain the notion of him being around in the long term and uh, think of Lukashenko sort of still being, you know, two to five year frame. Maybe that's sort of, that's what behind my an what's behind my answer. But I do think that lines have been crossed at this point that can't be walked back. And it's not just, the hijacking I think was a culmination, but it wasn't just the hijacking alone. I think it's everything that has transpired, not even since August, but I would, I would say, you know, June, and over the past year, exactly, actually, you know, June leading up to now, I think having 480 political prisoners, 35,000 people arrested, tortured and beaten with um, excruciating, you know, documented with excruciating detail, jailing people for, red and white socks. I think there are all these things that have been building up to this moment. And I think the hijacking was just the latest one. And it's very hard for me to imagine you at least openly and overtly inviting him to any forum. I think, can I imagine some back door sort of closed door negotiation with him in order to maybe release, I mean, release Perdasevich or more political prisoners? I can, I can envision that. But I think openly imagining him being representing the state in any respectable European for it's hard for me to imagine. And frankly, I think that's what Putin is counting on um, with these Titanic, um, you know, mean photo, sh photo shoots. I think um, that one of the goals is to really isolate him and make him look only East um, for friends. I think he will start probably building again, if, if there is room for him to still be around connections with um, some Middle Eastern Arab states and more authoritarians, you know, looking East for partnerships. Um, we saw Erdogan applaud um, Lukashenko's tactics. So I think sure, certainly in the circle of authoritarians, he will he will have a chair. But I think um, with the EU, it's hard for me to imagine. Nate, do you want to take a little bit on how far sure. you think it's possible that the West will go? With well, this? yeah, I mean, I don't want to get into prognosticating just because I'm not yeah. I'm not close enough to the decision making to be able to say with authority kind of what people are thinking. But um, I think that the the question about where where this goes or, or how, whether he can be admitted back into the fold, I mean, obviously people, we all have examples in our heads of different situations. There's Maduro, right, in Venezuela. Um, there's Karimov after Andijan. Um, there are, it, people stay in power. We all know that, we're not naive. Um, that said, Belarus is in a specific place. The, the opposition and the exiles are in Europe. They're in Poland and Lithuania and other European countries. They are in European capitals. Um, this, this incident itself that took place, this specific one involves um, you know, European aviation. Um, it is a lot harder, I think, for, it should be a lot harder, let me just say. I won't, let me not try to project what they're thinking, but it should be much harder for European policymakers, especially to say, oh, that's over there, you know, that's, that's something very far away. And sure, there's some Venezuelan exiles in Spain and, you know, Nicaraguans in, in Spain. And, you know, we've got various Middle Easterners living in London and, and we're worried about them. Or we have Turkish journalists living in Germany and we're worried about them. But, you know, this is, this is very much, a, including within the European self-image, Belarus is very much a part of that, 
right? <laughs> this isn't, if you've included Poland and you've included Lithuania and you've included Ukraine, you've already included this, this polity, right? In your self-image. And the only thing that's keeping it from being incorporated essentially is Lukashenko. And so you really do, I think, have to ask like, what's the, you know, wh why would we be permitting that to go on? And of course the answer would be that we don't know how to change it or we're not, we're afraid of the consequences if we try to change it or to engage with that seriously. But that's what it is, it, it, right? Is it's not actually, there isn't the same kind of, I think, psychological block um, to thinking about a, Bel a, a future where Belarus is a part of the European space properly, um, which is also what the opposition is openly saying, right? That's what they're asking for. So it's a very sympathetic and logical conclusion to say they should be a part of this. You know, they want to be, and we want them to be too. Great, thanks so much. Um, I want to uh, use uh, the next question to ask something um, a little, a little broader about the dynamics of transnational repression, and um, especially this notion that Nate picked up on. You know. Who do citizens of a particular country belong to when they're in exile, right? And it seems to be sort of this, this tension between two very strong norms. One is the strong sovereignty norm, which authoritarians everywhere uh, strongly believe in, right? That uh, what happens on a physical territory of a country is very much in the domain of that particular country um, versus, um, you know, uh, uh, the norms of, um, how they're viewing it, um, citizenship, how they would express it in terms of sort of ensuring government and sort of state security. Um, so, 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 so there's an interesting point brought up here by Nate that um, how is it that states that are meant to extend these protections, um, whether it be asylum, temporary residency, um, you know, some sort of uh, process to sort of determine status and so forth, um, um, can so easily uh, not view this as a matter of their own territorial government and sovereignty and national interest. Um, and that in fact, it's ascending state taking some of its citizens sort of back. And, 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 and how has there been a progression of this, I suppose, or a normative shift? So Nate, why don't we start with you? But then I'd love to get some other people's thoughts, including Hannah, your thought about the communities outside of Belarus. Uh, and how they interact with with uh, um, this internal and external dimension. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, I I will emphasize, I guess, that the, to, to start that the norms or the frame from which we want it to be approached is a rights frame and 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 around a frame of rights and the the rights that everyone has, no matter where they are. Um, but including when they are in exile or diaspora or however we're defining where they are, and that is irrespective of their legal status in that place. If they're a, a naturalized citizen, if they're a permanent resident, if they're an undocumented migrant. I mean, the, the things we're talking about, especially in our, in our case, when we're talking about transnational oppression, things we're talking about, violence against people, you know, literal physical violence, um, people being attacked, uh, physically being kidnapped, um, these are things that violate very basic rights. Um, we're not asking for kind of the biggest scope of rights within the rights field. We're talking about the very core political and civil rights. Um, you know, I think that there is an issue, there's a lot of issues, of course, now getting outside of that frame around identity. I mean, that's, that's part of what we're talking about here regarding Belarus is that there are issues around the identities of the people themselves and are they seen as a part of Europe? right? Are these people going to be included in the European imagination? Um, and obviously, I think that they should be. Um, and I, I believe in people being included. Um, yeah, I, I think that from the state perspective regarding sovereignty, I mean, um, certainly what we see repeatedly is that many states are willing to discard that rather quickly um, when it comes up. Um, I'm not going to say that in this case that's going to be what happens, but certainly, you know, we can look at um, Turkish citizens being kidnapped from all over the world. We can look at um, others, Rwandans, um, including some who are naturalized citizens of other European countries, um, where once they are back in the custody of that origin state, there is a like, mm, not really ours. Um, and I do think that that continues to be one of like the the the, the sorest points in this um, about 
who is entitled to those protections, even when they've obtained the legal validation um, and, and whether those protections are really durable um, in those situations. Thanks for this. Uh, Hannah, I'd be interested in your reflections on the same issue as it pertains to internal external dynamics in Belarus and uh, places like Poland or Vilnius and so forth. Right. Um, yeah, so maybe, um, um, yeah, because your question was also about like this protection of foreign states, right? Um, and I do believe that those people kind of remain and uh, uh, protection of foreign states, I think it's clear. Um, also, which is now I think Belarusians kind of are paying attention to immensely, is that they're trying to start launch cases under universal jurisdiction, which is kind of some sort of um, um, well, I'm not a lawyer, but anyway, so it means that if they suffered um, violence, uh, brutality, torture in Belarus, they might ask um, foreign states uh, to kind of investigate the issue, right? Because they are now in those foreign states. And there were cases already started in Lithuania, um, in Poland. Um, so, so that's something where kind of this is not only them fleeing for those countries, but, but kind of some real kind of tangible also help, you know, coming from the states. Um, at the same time, I remember many years ago, there was this case of Alice Belatsky, prominent human rights defender, whose accounts were uh, kind of uh, the information about his accounts were transferred to the Belarusian uh, regime. Um, and that's how he was uh, detained and he was arrested. He, he was jailed for some three years, as far, as far as I remember. So that's something that was a lesson, I think, that taught um, um, both Lithuania and Poland, but also other countries not to kind of um, collaborate right with the Belarusian regime because they use this information to uh, arrest the the you know dissidents to arrest the opposition, um, and that's also uh, kind of where Interpol should consider um, kind of suspension perhaps of of Belarus and its membership in in, in Interpol or at least not to reveal information. Um, otherwise, uh, kind of on a general level, um, I mean we've never been. Um, safe uh, in you know neither Poland nor Lithuania nor any other country. Um, perhaps we are not um, uh, kind of treated with Novichok there, but there is surveillance. There are threats. Uh, I don't know. I don't take phones to important meetings because I know that you know that they might be uh, bugged. They might be listened to. And yeah, I mean, several times I, I noticed surveillance. So this is not like uh, we feel safe, you know, abroad. Thanks for that. Uh, Tanya, do you have any quick thoughts on this too, the whole clash of norms in, in this work on, on, on exiles and, and transnational repression? I will just make a quick point that I've been making around all of this is that this is all intricately connected with um, the anti-immigrant sentiment around the world. And um, you know, this is not an isolated incident that's just about Belarus, but it really uh, speaks to this populist tactic of making immigrants seem other and make um, countries less immigrant friendly and care less about what happens to immigrants. So first not allowing them in and then caring less about what happens to them if they are allowed in. I think that's an important point to remember. And that has been an effective, I think, advocacy point, particularly in the US and some other countries in the West, saying that you know, the rhetoric that started with Trump and never went away, it actually is directly connected to what just happened with the plane hijacking and with what happens with exile safety around the world. So that's just the only point I would add. Hey, you have a quick follow up on norms? Yeah, quick follow up. I mean, first was just to say absolutely what Tanya said. I mean, and we very much focused on this in the report in February, this, this securitization of migration, demonization of people who cross borders kind of fundamentally leads to more opportunities for repression. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, sorry, that I hadn't thought of, I, I think one of the norm clashes we have actually is more about it from the sovereignty perspective is about equality of sovereignty and about the ways in which international institutions and international relations are built on each of these uh, entities being equally legitimate. So in Interpol, this is, this is kind of the underlying problem in Interpol and we could talk about that at length, but it's built on the idea that all of these uh, states are acting in good faith and are equally uh, approaching the issue of international police cooperation um, from a good faith perspective, even when there's far more evidence of the opposite for some very large percentage of states participating in the organization. And that's only one example. You see this across the board. And that's the issue that you have here is, will we go back to saying, well, 
you know, it's, it's fundamentally legitimate that Lukashenko is the leader of Belarus, and he's legitimately uh, in charge of Belarus. And as such, he has a place at the table as a, uh, an equal partner in various kinds of conversations. And we expect, um, you know, that we will share the table equally with him when he's behaving in a fundamentally illegitimate way, he's behaving in a way that undermines that premise completely, whether it's this, this abduction or whether it's torture and abuse. Um, and I think that's the question that that's the one where I think we're really struggling. Okay, so two, we're running short on time. Two remaining questions that have been in the chat and also in the from the YouTube channel. Um, one, Yuval, just you had mentioned earlier that um, you thought eventually Putin would drop Lukashenko, that he would become, and other people have touched on this a little bit. But um, can you just explain why this isn't a, a better situation for Putin, right, where Lukashenko is completely dependent on him and is sort of severed ties with the West? Why will that inevitably, why might that transition into wanting to drop him as opposed to sort of keeping him in, the, in this potentially subservient role, although subservient might be pushing it given that he just gave him $500 million, so he's not totally uh, subservient. And then the other question from the YouTube channel is that one of the speakers, and I confess I don't remember who said this, it might've been you as well, Yuval, is that said that Putin will have to explain the behavior of his client state to Biden uh, at the coming summit. And so was just an interest about commenting on the implications of this. Do we think that this is actually going to be raised at the summit? And if so, what impact is it gonna have on the, on the other ongoing discussions? Is it just something that's gonna get folded in with a short conversation about Navalny and a few other things about these kind of things? Or is this a sort of larger potential issue that has the potential to be something important that comes out of the, the meeting between uh, Biden and Putin? And, um, and we're short on time, so whoever is answering it, if you could be brief, that'd be great. Yuval? Sure, uh, let me try and take those quickly. So in terms of Putin explaining you know, Lukashenko's behavior to Biden, the sort of lemonade out of the, the lemon here that Putin is gonna want is Biden is going to tell him, your, your client is bad, did bad things, I want you to stop it. And to the extent that Putin can get Biden to acknowledge the concept of spheres of influence and that Belarus quote unquote belongs to Russia and that it doesn't exercise sovereignty on its own, that would be a big win because if the principle is legitimated, then it's just horse trading, which country belongs to which great power. Um, so that would be great for Putin. And so earlier when I was talking about, you know, what is the value of, and you know, might Lukashenko be forced to move on? It was in the context of thinking about, um, you know, Lukashenko now has 500 million extra dollars, but what if basically the pressure from the street continues and continues? If 50,000 people get arrested, 100,000, if the Belarusian army and internal security starts shooting people like openly on the streets, that would be in essence the sort of thing in which Put Lukashenko's hold on power might become basically too objectionable if the methods that he uses are too violent and too coercive in order to be acceptable even for President Putin. And that was basically the comment. Great, thanks so much. So folks, we are out of time. I just wanna thank all the panelists involved for um, appearing today. Thank you for your insights. I wanna thank all the audience members um, for listening, sharing your time, asking your questions. And with this also comes the closing of another academic year of our RPP. So we're gonna take a couple of months off, um, but the RPP will be back in September. Josh and I have to have a conversation about what kind of format is possible and you know what we will do exactly, but you can count on us um, being back next year for another academic year. So all that's left to say is uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, wishing you a good summer, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, and uh, we will uh, see you in a couple months time with another event in September.